Right. So, take it away. All right. So, a couple of lectures ago, Dan talked about um, type theories and the way in which, if you're given a type theory, you can construct a topos out of it. And what I'm going to be talking about today is sort of how you can go in the other direction. So given a topos, there's a canonical type theory which is associated to it. Uh, in particular, this allows us to sort of specify sub-objects in a topos by logical formulas. So for instance, the example I'll give at the very end is given objects x and y in a topos, you can specify the object of all ethnomorphisms as all f in y to the x, such that all y is x and x, such that f of x is equal to y. Now, on the face of it, that doesn't make any sense because the objects don't necessarily ha necessarily have elements and we don't know what any of these symbols mean in the language of a topos. So what I'm going to be sort of devoting most of the talk to is defining exactly what this means. The thing that sort of takes the most work is the quantifiers. So that's what I'm going to focus on in the first part. So... So it's just a question of notation. You've got y, f is in, f is a member of y cross... Y to the x. So it's y the exponential. Cross. Yeah. Okay. So, so in the case of set, that's the set of all functions from x to y. Okay. This is thought about in the topos set, right? No, not it works in any topos. I, I, I understand. I understand that it's sort of the notation suggests as though it has elements, but this is just purely yeah, notation at this stuff. point. I don't understand epimorphisms like that. Isn't that kind of dodgy to think about? That's like subjective that? maths. Yeah. So if I was in yeah rings, then that's yeah, but rings maths. isn't a topos. Oh, uh, okay. Too shame. I, I too have worried a little bit about this and I'm not exactly certain what the resolution to this is. Oh. There's a way to do this properly that is you sort of construct a natural function that's called im and then you, you construct this object epi x y as the uh, pullback of im which basically says right. that it has full image. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, yeah it's, it's not obvious that, right, this funny subjectivity which is encoded on the right hand side and to be interpreted Anyway, Sorry. Uh, let's restrict to start with though in the case that set. Um, the way that we're going to deal with quantifiers is, so imagine you had some predicate, let's call it S. Um, let's say it's got some free variables X, Y. Well then, in the usual way, you can regard S as a subset of X cross Y, a relation, which basically, um, it's consists of all the pairs where this would evaluate is true. So or the predicate so would evaluate is true. What is a predicate? It's just a predicate in the usual logical sense. So it's just a, it's just a formula with possibly some free variables that either evaluates the true or false, depending on what you sub in. Okay, so now I think you're... It's essentially a relation. That's just what it is. Okay, so is it a relation or is it a symbol? Is it just a member of some set that we're calling the predicate symbols of this language? Yeah, basically. It's just a relation. I, I, At the moment there's no language, right? So we literally just do this function from x cross y to 0, 1. Yeah. Okay. Um, so... I'm going to write throughout, given a set x, I'm going to write px for just the power set. And for reasons that will become clear sort of later on, I'm going to write p, which goes from x cross y to y for the projection. So, if we have some formula or some predicate s x y, and we want to talk about the a new constructing a new formula uh, for all x s, then it would sort of make sense, right, that s should capture uh, for all x 
S should capture the X, and so now this should just be a subset of Y. So it's the set of Y such that for all X, this is true. Or oh, this is in, in S. So let's turn that into a definition. Give it a subscript P. For all P, uh, S, we define that as the set of all Y in Y such that X, Y is in S for all X in X. And then similarly, uh, uh, exist P, S is the set of all Y in Y. S for some um, the reason for the subscript P will become clear in a couple of theorems time but for now it's just sitting there uh, so this defines a set but we can also turn this into a functor between this p and for all p which go from p of x cross y to p of y. So, so first, uh, yep. You said up there that px is the power set of x and you've got any notes that px is the Boolean algorithm or some sets of x. Mm -hmm. Which one is it? Are you saying that px has the... Uh, yeah, I, I, it doesn't matter. <laughs> So it's, at the moment, what I need it to be is a poset, because in order for these to be functors, these need to be categories, right? Yep. So they're posets, they turn into categories with the arrows being inclusions. Or more explicitly, there's a unique arrow as long as x. So if, if a precedes b, then there's a unique arrow a to b, otherwise there's no arrows. Um, but that's the only structure that I actually need. OK, so that's not just a set. You also want the extra sub, you also want the subset. Yeah. Um, I had another point to make about this. Oh yeah, that's right. So it's not maybe totally clear that they're actually functors, right? Because I've only specified what you do on objects. I need to specify what you do on morphisms. But because the home sets are either singletons or empty, if I'm sending a singleton to a singleton, I'm fine, and I have no choice. It has to just send it to the only thing. If I'm sending an empty to an empty, I'm fine. The only thing I need to check is that I don't ever try and send a home set that's singleton to an empty set. But that cannot happen because for any S subset S, S prime, we have for all P S subset for all P S prime and exists P S subset exists P S prime. So in other words, it preserves inclusions. So we're safe. All right. Theorem. Let P in this pre, pre image be the Inverse is just the, the pre image functor for the projection map, which I find up there. Then we have a junction given by this P is left out joint to P inverse, which is in turn left out joint to for all P.
All right. So what do we actually have to show? We have to come up with Homestead bijections. And again, the Homesteads are just singletons or empty. So we just have to make sure that we're sending singletons to singletons and likewise for empty sets. So. just the pre-image of P. So it, it takes, if you, you're given a subset of Y, take the pre-image under P, that should give you a subset of X cross Y. That's what it does. Right. And this is all still working in the basic category. Yes. So it's functorial because again, pre-image preserves inclusions. Okay. So the bijections are that we need hom this P S goes to T. Needs to be in bijection with um, S P inverse T. And then likewise we also need um, P inverse T uh, yeah. S needs to be in bijection with um, for all P S. And that is for T as a subset of Y. So that's for all T subset of Y and uh, S is a subset of X cross Y. Now, as I said, because the home set's singletons or empty, all we need to show. S is a subset of T if and only if S is a subset of P inverse T. And then likewise, uh, P inverse T is a subset of S if and only if T is a subset of for this talk. <laughs> things like this for exams when I was doing chemistry. <laughs> yeah, all the time. I just remember it's backwards for our joints. <laughs> Alright, let's just do those inclusions. So, do the one on the right first. So, P inverse T, subset of S. It's true if and only if P of X, Y is in T, <laughs> or if then uh, Y, sorry, uh, X, Y is in S. So P 
of x, y is just y, so it's the same thing as saying if y is in t, then x, y is in s for all s. Uh, sorry, for all uh, x in x. And then that's just the same thing as what we wanted, which is t is a subset of uh, for p. And then likewise the other one, so S is a subset of P inverse T. That's true if and only if, if Y in S Y is in S, and for any S, it doesn't. If for any X, it doesn't really matter which one. <coughs> or some X in X, then uh, Y, which is just P of X, Y is in T, and then that's the same thing as saying that exists P S is a subset of P. So we're done. Okay, so now I can sort of get to the point of why I've got this subscript p around. It turns out that a very similar construction just generalizes to any arbitrary function f. So let me just do that. Let f z to y be a function. Inset. Yeah, sorry, that's not right, because we're jumping between presets and yeah, yeah. preset categories and set. Uh, you're saying arbitrary morphism, that's morphism in set, right? Yes, so this is a function in set. Okay. And then it's going to give rise to a function functor on the posets. is a subset of uh, Z. And we define for all f s the set of all y and y such that for all uh, x in, no, z in z if f of z is equal to y then uh, Z is an S. And then exists F S is Y. It's the set of all Y and Y such that there exists. Z in S such that F of Z equals Y, which is just sort of, it was just the image. Okay. And unsurprisingly, the theorem we just did generalizes to this case. Uh, so exists 
f has left our joint to f inverse preimage has left our joint to all f. And I won't bother proving that because it's essentially the same thing, just translating. Okay. The next thing I want to do is we've been working in sets so far, so I want to generalize this to a topos. Um, the idea being that instead of using the, the post set of all, uh, the, the power set, we're going to use the set of sub-objects of a given object x. In particular, well, first things first, that can be equipped with the structure of a post set because if you remember, sub-objects -object are just monomorphisms or equivalence classes of monomorphisms. So one monomorphism will precede another if it factors through. Um, but we can... Say that again. So we're talking about the post set sub a x. Mm -hmm. So the underlying set is... Um, the sub-objects... So the sub-objects are equivalence classes of monomorphisms into X. Um, the equivalence relation being basically... Uh, let's see if I can remember this exactly. So the equivalent, basically what the equivalence relation is doing is it's ensuring that two monomorphisms, if the domains have a bijection, you don't want them to be specifying different sub-objects, right? Yeah. So we're, just, we're doing the usual sort of abusive notation where we identify a subset with an injective map. But there are more injective maps than there are subsets, right? Because there are lots of injective maps that correspond to the same sort of domain. So take a set <coughs> of monomorphisms into an object. There's a partial, well, not a partial order, but there's a relation on that, which is, you say, one more. So every time I say one, I write down the equivalence relation of Janus over that. If you identify as one more, this one is isomorphic. Yeah. Isomorphic domains. Well, not quite. Yeah. So, because they need to be isomorphisms, which are compatible, make that little diagram commute, right? You've got two one more. Yeah, maybe I should just write it. So, you've got M goes from S uh, to X, sub-object of X, and you've got M prime, which goes from S prime also into X. And you want to put, impose an equivalence relation where M, M is equivalent to M prime if there exists an ISO F goes from S to S prime such that so we want M equal to uh, M prime after F. Okay. So that's the set of the unlike sort of the set. Mm -hmm. What's the order? So the order is one monomorphism will precede another if the first monomorphism factors through the second one. Okay. Which if you think about the sort of simple case where they're all like, inclu if, if it's in sets and they're all inclusion errors, that's exactly what you want it to be, right? Because you want, you want the partial order to be the, the subset relation. And so, uh, and you, therefore you want it to you want one inclusion to factor, if, if one inclusion factors through another, then that means that the first thing is a subset of the second thing. And that's what you want. Sorry to interrupt. You can think about it this way. Yeah. You have a set of the relation which is reflexive, transitive, uh, but not anti symmetric, which is what you need for it to be a partial order, where you can always quotient out by the relation which says identify two things which are less than you before. Right? That's what Jack's just did. That's a nice way of thinking about yeah, that. Okay, go on. Okay, so we have a uh, partial order on. I'm going to diverge slightly from the notes here and do it with uh, x times a. 
But if you recall, this is in bijection, or yeah, this is isomorphic to uh, Hom x times a with the suborder classifier, which is then further in bijection, natural bijection with a going from omega to the x. And so because we have a partial order on this, we can also induce a partial order on this. And that's going to turn these things into categories. And so therefore, we can talk about adjoint functors. And that's how we're going to define quantifiers in an arbitrary topos. So what's omega? Hmm? What's omega? Uh, Sub-object classifier in the definition of topos. Yeah. Uh, but in addition to that, sort of one other point is we can work with adjoints on these categories, but because of the inner dilemma, we can actually translate adjunctions that we have here into a morphism that actually goes from, uh, it's going to be omega, well, I'll get to it in a second. The, but basically what that means is we can actually talk about the adjoint pairs internally inside the topos as opposed to having to do it on the home sets. So we'll get to that in a second. Let's make a definition. So let y and z be objects. And let's have phi going from omega to the y to omega to the z. And let's have psi going from omega to the z um, to omega to the y. We say that phi is internally left adjoint. Psi. If the if for every object A in so every object A in the topos gives rise to an induced map on the home sets uh, via composition. And we're going to say that it's internally that's adjoint if the induced maps are adjoints with respect to the partial order that we just gave the home sets. Uh, form adjoint. And specifically with uh, phi on the left. So let's actually write out the diagram involved because it sort of makes it a bit easier to understand what these maps actually are. So we have hom a omega to the y. We have hom a omega to the z. And this map here is phi star, and it's specifically given by post composition with phi. And then this map back this way is psi star, and specifically even the post composition with psi. And what we want is we want an adjoint pair. Okay.
Okay. Theorem. This is essentially the translation of the theorem we've just done, but to a toe boss. So let f uh, z to y. Y, omega of Z, map. There exist internal adjoints. Exists f for all f to go from omega to the z. I should say to omega to the f because otherwise it looks like they are internal adjoints of each other. And that goes from that to omega to the y on the left and right. So let A be an object and consider pre image. This, which goes from uh, sub y cross a to sub z cross a. Now, because these are sets, we can apply the theorem that we just did or a ge slight generalization of the theorem we just did to obtain left and right adjoints to this. So we get left and right. This map and they are exist uh, F cross ID and for all F cross ID and they go from sub. Pull 
So because this construction is natural in A, so are these functors, or these constructions are natural in A. That's not totally obvious, but the, the reasons for it are sort of too complicated to get to, into in this talk. Um, it's from something called the beck chevalier condition. Anyway, we can also take these, uh, these functors and translate them into homesets by the, the bidirections that I just mentioned previously. So these if, uh, and they are denoted by exists F. And for all F star, and they go from home uh, blank, don't make it a Z, and home uh, blank, make it a Y. Explicitly, these are the things that make the following commute. Uh, y times A. Z times A. Um, These are just the natural bijections. This map here and this map here. So this one on the top is F times ID inverse. This one here is exists F times ID. This one here is mega F star, or well, the component of it corresponding to A. And this one here is uh, exists F star A, or the component of that natural transformation corresponding to A. This notation is sort of slightly cheating because these things are also parameterized in terms of A, but I haven't bothered to specify that in the notation. That's just because it's there are enough subscripts around already. <laughs> um, oh, I should also say I didn't define that there, but that's because this map here, omega to the f, was the thing that's in the statement of the theorem. And then you get an induced map on the home sets by uh, composition, in much the same way as the definition of the adjoint. It's sort of this, this theorem is almost kind of a trick because I'm using the notation as star even though before, before I've actually defined the map that it's star of. And so it's sort of like I'm pretending. Like when you do it like this, it almost looks like there's nothing to prove, but there is actually something to prove that the thing that I get out is actually, its induced map is this, but you, it's, it's not very difficult if you go to the unit on there and look what it does. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> anyway. Um, since these are adjoint pairs, these are also adjoint pairs. That's a check in the fact that these are natural. And the definition of the, the categorical structure on the home sets, it's essentially by the definition. Now, oh, I should also say there's a corresponding diagram for, for all, but I haven't bothered to draw that because it's essentially the exact same thing, just with the exists replaced by for all. Now, by Unita, Natural transformations of this form are in bijection So 
So net transformations to go from um, blank uh, omega to the z to um, blank omega to the y uh, in bijection. with just hom of uh, omega to the z, omega to the y. So, obtain morphisms. from omega to the z, to omega to the y. This is what we already had, it's omega to the f. And then by unator, we obtain ones to go back the other way. So that's going to be what we denote by exists f. This one's going to be what we denote by for all f. And then you can check that the induced maps of these guys are exactly those, and that's exactly the condition we needed for them to be internal eye joints, so we're done. Four. Uh, a type theory is a class of objects or a class of types, including two special types. Suggestively noted, denoted as omega and one. And a class of terms, terms of each type. Including countably many variables. Of each type. Um, there's also a binary relation called entailment, but I won't go into too much detail on what that is in this case. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm trying to understand what you mean by a class in terms of each type. So you're saying that for each type, you have a class, and you're calling the elements of that class in terms of that type. Um, and obviously, the, the ter the, there's, there's more details, at least in Dan's talk, about the types of terms you have. There's like term construction rules, you build them recursively in the sort of normal way from variables and operations. Uh, I don't want to, I'm about to get into that anyway, so we'll do that when I get to it. So. So 
the Mitchell Benbow language, which I'll denote by uh, the So it's a it's a type theory which is associated to a topos. Types are just objects. Terms, the definition is sort of vague about what the terms actually are. The terms are built recursively. Associated to each term, not the same thing as the term itself, but associated to each term. Sigma is a morphism, which is sigma bar, and it goes from. Uh, I'm going to find, write this and then define it right after. Which term sigma type x. So it goes from a set of free variables or to x. So if v sigma is just the set of free variables of sigma, the bar is, so let's say that the, so say that the free variables of sigma is just some set x1, xn, then we define fv bar of sigma and let's say that these are all of types capital X1 through capital Xn, then this is just defined as the product of those types. So intuitively, you should think of this as what is a term that has free variables in it, like a logical formula, for example. Well, it takes in the free variables, you can substitute in actual things of that type. And if you do, you'll get the type of the term out. And that's what this is saying. So you substitute in something of type x1, something of type dot dot dot, something of type xn. And then the result is sigma with those things subbed in, and that's of type x. So that's what the output is. OK. This morphism we call its interpretation. I mean, I would say denotation, but that's just because I'm biased. I've been using uh, denotation for too long.
his interpretation of that that he signed back in the world. It's sort of like a half half version, right? Because it's not just a semantics, because the types themselves are the objects. But then the the terms you want to just say the terms are morphisms, but that doesn't work. And you'll see why in the very next sentence that I'm about to write up why it doesn't work. So you have to do this sort of half this sort of pseudo version of the thing that you actually want to say, but Basically, what it ends up being is you have to sort of differentiate between the terms, which are just these objects, and then their interpretations, which are the morphism. You can't just say they're the same thing. And the reason for that is, or one of the reasons for that is, or each type there are countably many variables. So the usual thing. Xi of type X. With the interpretation of Xi is just given the identity morphism from X X. So if you just said that type, if you just said that terms were morphisms, then that would be a problem here, right? Because you'd be, you only have one identity error, but you want to give all of the terms the interpretation is the identity error. So if a term sigma of type x and a term tau of type y there is a product term. Type x times uh, x cross y. And how are we going to interpret that? So it's interpreted by the following. So what is the free variable set of? this term, well it's just the union of the free variable sets of these terms. Um, and it's of type x cross y. And what we do is we just take the usual map of the product. So it's going to be sigma bar p tau bar q So let me say in words a little more detail on that. So P is projection from this product, which is the product uh, parameterized over that, uh, the set of the union of the variables in sigma and tau. And then you're just projecting onto the free variables that are in sigma. That's what P does. Likewise, Q just projects onto the, the products containing just the free variables in tau. So then if you then post compose that thing with sigma bar and that and then Q with tau bar, that's well defined, right? Because you've killed you've 
thrown out all the variables that Sigma Bar didn't know about, and likewise for Tau Bar. And then you just take the usual map of the product, and that will give you, so this thing will give you the thing in X, and this thing will give you the thing in Y. Given two terms of the same type, uh, sigma uh, tau of type x, there is a term uh, sigma equals tau of type omega. Interpreted by sigma equals tau. So that should again go from the free variable set of sigma, union free variable set tau. This arrow here should go into x cross x. And it's just that arrow again. So it's uh, sigma bar p, tau bar q. And then how would you check that these two factors are equal? Well, that's just take delta x, which goes to omega. What is this map? It's just the characteristic function of the diagonal from x to x cross x. Sequence with three elements of sigma equals tau. Yeah. Okay. I, I, assuming I answer what you just said, then yeah, I think that's right. So it's 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 the equals there doesn't mean anything. It's just a formal symbol, right. and we're defining this term involving that formal symbol. Um, I should I should say that terms of type omega will be called formulas. And the idea is that they, they have truth values. So this essentially, in the case of sets, this would evaluate to 1 if sigma and tau were equal, and it would evaluate to 0 if they weren't. What other terms are there? Uh, sigma of type y to the x. So y to the x and of type x. Um, uh, sigma bracket tau with interpretation Sigma union free variable tau. We should go to y to the x cross x. It's just the same arrow as before. And this map here should go to y. And this 
is the evaluation x, y. And in the particular case where y is omega, instead of writing this, we will write Um, sigma in tau as opposed to sigma bracket tau. Uh, and there's composition. So this one's a bit weird. So given sigma of type x and an arrow. F, which goes from X to Y in E. There is a term. F composed sigma of type Y. Interpreted as the obvious composite. Um, so, yeah, this one allows you to build terms out of things that aren't necessarily terms. So, you can take an arrow, it doesn't this, this could be an arrow that corresponds to a term, but it doesn't have to be. And yeah, and this does give you all of them because if you just take this one to be an identity, then it's going to give you any any error. And every error gets shoved in countably many times. <laughs> Um, and then the last one, given sigma of type uh, z with x, so a variable x inside the free variables of sigma. Sigma interpreted by so this goes from free variables. Yeah, I was thinking this over as I was coming in today. So. You just get the empty set in one row now and put a one there. The trouble is. I agree that this is fine. Like, this would be fine. It wouldn't change anything, right? But the trouble is here. This should be of type z to the x, right? And if it didn't have a free variable type x, then you're, that shouldn't be right, right? Because... Oh yeah, that's, that's actually a good point. Actually, I'm, hmm, I'm not convinced. I mean, my, my policy with these things is just don't do stupid things and try and take out free variables <laughs> you don't have and you'll be fine. <laughs> so you want to get rid of alpha, alpha renaring. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the idea of capturing variables is dumb. No one, no one ever does that. It's, it's just you have to do it because 
the, the language doesn't forbid it. <laughs> anyway. Um, so what is the actual interpretation? It's just the, uh, so remember the exponential gives you a bijection between things of this form and the ones where you pull the x over. So it's just that, that's the, you just take the transpose of the map of the interpretation of sigma. Okay. Uh, one more thing. A formula. Mega, and we say a formula sigma is true if sigma bar factors through true. I've run out of space. <laughs> but true, that, that's the monomorphism in the definition of a solid object classifier. So do that. Yeah. So it goes from the terminal object to the solid object classifier. Five minutes. So I don't know whether I should skip the stuff on propositional connectives. Yeah, I guess it's not so bad. Proof I outlined for you that the conjunction works for entanglement doesn't actually work. That the construction idea does not work. <laughs> so after some sort of deliberation, I just took it out of the notes. I mean, I think you can do it the way you outlined, right? But it's, it's just about a, a property of the, the sub-objects and their meet, which works. But it's sort of a little bit unsatisfying because the whole point of this was to try and do things independently of yeah. the external properties. Anyway. So conjunction. So since formulas, by formula what I really mean is logical formula. So we want to have all the usual um, connectives of logic as well as quantifiers. Now in the, the way that we'll put those into the language is through something which we've already defined, which is the composite of a term with the morphism. It turns out, and I'll briefly uh, explain why this is the case, that there is a morphism which goes from omega cross omega to omega, which if you compose this with a, a pair the, the product term corresponding to a pair of more, uh, a pair of formulas, you end up getting a formula that corresponds to their conjunction. I think this is a bit of a mouthful. The I, I suppose in the familiar case of sets, this is sort of doing what you would expect. Where if you remember the subordinate classifier in sets is zero one, so this thing is going to be zero one gets sent to zero, one zero gets sent to zero, zero zero gets sent to zero, and one one gets sent to one. Um, okay, so how do we construct that? So what we do is we note that sub uh, so we have a
have an operation on the sub-objects, which corresponds to taking their meat, because it's a post set, so this meat exists. And that goes from Well, this is isomorphic to sub equals b. Uh, wait, no, I want to do the other way, don't I? Yeah. Hom b omega cross hom b omega, which is in turn isomorphic to hom b omega cross omega. And likewise over here, we have B omega. Furthermore, because this is natural in B and these are natural isomorphisms, the whole composite here is also natural in B. And we will call it Omega, uh, sorry, uh, wage B. Yep. And so this gives rise obtain a natural transformation, which is called wedge, which goes from on blank. Omega to um, blank omega. And much like what we saw with the quantifiers, because of the innate element, this immediately gives us a map that goes from omega cross omega to omega. Again, going to denote by wedge. <laughs> then, if we're given terms, which uh, so sigma, or I should say, given formulas. Terms of right type omega. Given formula sigma tau. Sigma. We obtain a term. Sigma wedge tau. As the comps or interpreted. Wedge following. So take the sigma tau product term and then compose it with the morphism in omega. I mean, I suppose if you didn't want to pull all morphisms in, right, you could avoid it by uh, not only allowing composition of terms where the corresponding domains were compatible, or domain and domain were compatible, and then just explicitly put in all the connectives. I should say, by the way, that all the other connectives follow in pretty much the same way. I just did conjunction because it's easiest. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Makes me start thinking that all this is intuition. Yeah. Why 
Okay, for quantifiers, we're going to do something rather similar in flavor to this, in that we're going to compose the product term with a special map for all, or exists. So what is that term? Well, it's the, it comes from the work we did at the start of the seminar talk. So, suppose that we have a formula and I'm just going to write its interpretation here. So it has some free variable type x, and it has some other free variable. So I'm just going to package them all together as u. And it's a formula, so it goes to omega. Yes. So now consider. Unique, unique map P, which goes from X to 1. It has internal adjoints. Oh, sorry, and the induced map. Which goes from, so it's omega to the P, and it goes from omega to the 1, which is just omega, or isomorphic to omega, to omega to the x. So this has internal adjoints. Okay, so, so let's just write here omega. This is omega to the x. This is the exists p. This is for all p. So make it of the p, and then the adjoints go like this. But then that tells us how to deal with uh, the term for all x in x sigma. Where? Well, you're about to write for all x, but x has not been mentioned before. Yeah, fine. <laughs> yeah okay. <laughs> uh, so sigma has, has a free variable x, right? Is that the only complaint? Uh, the only problem? <laughs> the only problem? Well, uh, I could also complain potentially as a free variable. Oh, whatever. <laughs> Sorry, that was a bit more sassy than I intended to be. <laughs> um, so for all, uh, so then for all x in x sigma as inter. Uh, for all x in sigma, sorry, that's not what I mean, for all x in x sigma, so it's going to be, start with free variable sigma x 
at the x. You take lambda x dot sigma, or the interpretation of it, that lands you in uh, omega to the x, and then you take for all p, and that lands you in omega. And then likewise exists is just the obvious thing with for all replaced by exists. And to finish, let's come back to the thing I mentioned at the very beginning, which is now we can specify objects using logical formulas. And here's how you do that. So notation, which at this point is just notation, it doesn't actually have meaning a priori, and I think this one they actually say in, or I think I changed this one slightly from the book and I can't remember what it mentions about free variables for this one. I think I want to say x and x such that true to pick out the whole thing. You're slowing me. That's okay. <laughs> in other words, oh sorry, I should have a bar. In other words, this is the sub-object of x, which is classified by this, this map. It's got, that, it's got that as its characteristic function. Cool. That's basically yeah. the end. Yeah.